Bill Clinton is a very charismatic person. He is not glamorous. I mean, he might be glamorous occasionally for five minutes, right. but basically, you know, we know way right, right. too much about <laughs> Bill Clinton. Hi, I'm Ted Balaker with Reason TV, and today I'll be speaking with Virginia Postrel. Postrel is a Wall Street Journal columnist, editor-in-chief of DeepGlamour.net, and former editor-in-chief of Reason Magazine. Oscars just around the corner, so let's let's talk Oscars, some red carpet stuff. I think it's interesting. Uh, it's something that I didn't think much about before, but anything that any of us see on the red carpet at the Oscars or anywhere can be and is turned into a knockoff almost instantly, and it's legal. Can you explain how that can be? For complex reasons having to do with the d definition of clothes as utility, uh, a fashion design is not patentable uh, the way a design for a computer chip might be. Fashion has long been used by economists and others who study intellectual property as an industry that illustrates how you can have massive amounts of innovation uh, over a long period of time, a sustainable innovation, without having strong intellectual property protections. There are certain types of intellectual uh, property protections for certain elements of fashion. So in my most recent Wall Street Journal column, which was about in incremental progress, I happened to quote my brother. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking about raincoats, and he, he works for the uh, apparel division of Merrill. They recently got a design patent for a jacket that can be turned into a neck pillow. You can do that because it's a unique design, but something like, and we were use this dress as I would, uh, something like a wrap dress, uh, which is an idea in the same way that a heist movie is an idea, is not, uh, you can't copyright or patent the idea for a certain style. What's happened in recent years is, uh, as with so many other industries, is the frictions that used to create a lag that allowed the original creator to reap benefits um, have gone away. There was a long period of time between the fashion show and when the knockoffs would appear in, you know, Macy's uh, that were uh, Right. Cheaper. But, and, but now, whatever but Natalie now, Portman but now, wears, you can get. Well, and not only what Natalie Portman wears, because what Natalie Portman wears may be something that was on a runway. What happens is people go, are taking pictures at the runway shows, and immediately knockoffs are being made. Now, a knockoff is not the same as the original. I mean, and that's one reason that you can't enforce what intellectual property protections do exist. Uh, let's take something that Natalie Portman might wear at the Oscars versus what somebody, the knockoff somebody might wear to buy to wear to their prom. Well, first of all, it will be made of uh, much cheaper fabric. The fabrication will be much more cheaply done. There'll be, you know, there'll be no hand work. Even the machine work will be, the seams won't be sealed as well. Anybody who knows garment construction will be able to look even at a nice line, knockoff and, and, and tell the difference. But it's not only that. These knockoffs are not designed for the same kinds of bodies. They're not designed for the same circumstances. They'll have other differences. They won't be as low cut. They, you think uh, of the, the, fame, the infamous uh, J-Lo dress. The yeah. infamous J-Lo dress. If you did a knockoff of that, I don't know that there were knockoffs wouldn't go of down that. To the belly button. wouldn't go down to the belly button. And actually, that fabric may have been something that could be uh, uh, trademarked also because fabrics can a uh, fabric oh, doesn't and, and, can and, be and, and trademarks as well the names of the brands yeah of course they're that, the names that, of the brands so that's and, the one and, and, kind of big part of right, the intellectual right, right. property and, puzzle actually. and what's interesting to me is that the award shows have become uh, very much fashion events I mean the fashion show is 90% of the publicity. Well, we mentioned Natalie Portman. I assume yeah. that she, it, she's clearly glamorous, correct? Or would she fit? She has a kind of glamour, oh, although really? I thought that would be a well, stone cold Well, <laughs> interestingly, it, it's interesting because she as a person 
uh, has a kind of glamour. She she wears clothes well. She went to Harvard, which you don't hear very often of actresses. She seems intelligent. She has made her mark, however, playing unglamorous roles often. Black Swan, obviously that's a very uh, sort of... It's darkly dark, glamorous. I yeah, guess, right? well, and it's there's a glamour to the ballet that it's kind of deconstructing. And it's a horror movie. It's explicitly a horror movie. And one of the observations that I've made is that horror is kind of the flip side of glamour. It's the, the unseen, uh, where, where the unseen, instead of just being boring, which is or work a day, is actually terrible. And then, I mean, I really thought she was great in V for Vendetta, which again has this long sequence where she's being starved and she gets her hair shaved and you know so she she but there's a difference between the roles they play yeah and the, right the, exactly the, so she image. her persona is uh is an interestingly sort of more glamorous persona despite having played these very unglamorous roles which is interesting what would you say about a fellow like colin firth because he he see it seems like he's glamorous Today you see him on, uh, you know, dressed up all spiffy on yeah. on the magazines and whatnot. But if he walked into IHOP, he wouldn't turn many heads if he was calling for, for right. a car sales. Right. Right? <laughs> what, is he yeah. glamorous? Glamour involves your ideal. And I don't think there are very many people who, when they think of an ideal type or a representative of whatever it is that they aspire to be or the person they aspire to be with, that Colin Firth is who comes to mind. Now, if you aspire to be a very good actor or something, it could be glamorous in the same way that, you know, if you aspire to run libertarian TV <laughs> on the web, <laughs> Ted dream, Malacher, yeah. glamour model. You know, so, uh -huh. so there are different kinds of glamour, but he is not what I would consider to be sort of a glamorous Hollywood star. He is a talented Hollywood star. He's, mm -hmm. you know, they're, mostly all good looking. Um, is it something that you can create or you just are or aren't? Certainly in the old studio days, the studios did a lot to try to glamorize their stars. And there are choices that individual actors can make that will make them more or less glamorous. One is how much they disclose about themselves. So glamour always requires a certain element of mystery. So if you are always yourself. I'm not talking about what the tabloids chase you because that no one ever knows if it's really true or not. But but if you yourself are in the sort of confessional mode all the time or or having meltdowns in public, no matter how beautiful you are and how great you wear dresses or whatever, you're probably not going to be glamorous. Or if you are, you're likely to lose it. And the interesting example is J-Lo who kind of had it, lost it from overexposure, and then over a long period of time, kind of rebuilt it slowly, slowly, slowly in her. So is her, J her, maybe J Lo's a model for President Obama? Because I know <laughs> you've said that he started off as a candidate as very glamorous, yeah. and then when reality hits, it's sort of like the more glamorous they are, the harder yeah. they fall. It's, it's a little hard when you're president because right. you can't just withdraw to your house on Long Island or wherever she lives and and mm -hmm. and, and and sort of be away from the public. I mean, what makes what makes it hard to maintain glamour as a president is that you have to um, actually make political choices or, or even the failure to make political choices is a choice. And, and, and when you make choices or you don't make choices, you will alienate some of the people who expected you to behave differently. Even the public that voted for Obama and is likely to vote for Obama again, I think they're sort of not looking for the dream they're, they're so much the as the, so so is, does uh, that uh, explain the appeal of someone like a governor chris christie well, I mean, like, he, he doesn't he doesn't strike me as glamorous but there's no. something there yeah, I yeah. Mean, people he has a speech at, at american uh, enterprise institute and people treat it like it's American Idol or something. Right. Well, well. first of all, very important in the political context is there is a difference between glamour and charisma. Usually when we talk about political figures, we talk about charisma. And there's a good reason. Because charisma is actually a rare personal quality that, you know, people just have it. Bill Clinton is a very charismatic 
person. He is not glamorous. I mean, he might be glamorous occasionally for five minutes, right. but basically, you know, we know way right, right. too much about <laughs> Bill Clinton um, and, and always was. I mean, he was always mm -hmm. like the regular guy. And Chris Christie, I think, has some charisma. He says what he thinks and, and, and right at this particular moment, people are, I think a lot of people want that kind of feeling of being genuine. You can list a whole lot of people that people are talking about. Right now there's a, a feeling that this person says what he thinks and I'm in the mood for that as opposed to being told what I necessarily want to hear. Mm -hmm.